If you've been following my content for a little bit, then you'll remember a couple episodes back that I told a story about a cook who had gained trust, presumably, to this restaurant. A very small restaurant. They only have a couple tables, and it's mostly a takeout place. And all of a sudden, the restaurant was never open. And when I encountered him, this was in the Becoming a Reality Shifter episode, and I used this as an example of saying that maybe we don't want to tell everybody about reality shifting if they are still in a very, very dark shadowy, unconscious existence. And I use my imagination to extrapolate some hidden parts of maybe the story with this guy who I thought was in one explanation, sabotaging the, the restaurant. And in another explanation, I was shifting in between reality layers where the restaurant was closed or never existed and giving an example of how we need to allow room for both possibilities. But when we're coming from a binary society, it is normal to make judgments and to say in a situation like this, that he was definitely lying. And we close out all of the other possibilities, which then locks us into a reality layer that we might not actually want to be in in the long run. And so if you can practice zooming out and saying, okay, maybe it's 90%, maybe 95% that he's lying, and maybe it's 5 to 10% that I'm reality shifting. All you have to do is practice this cognitive flexibility. And what will happen over time is that you will open up potentials to where you can slowly increase that ratio to reality shifting. And so anyway, I just wanted to give you a follow-up. I ran into the cook again. And the next time, I there's two times that I want to fill you in on. The next time after that conversation where he was like, no, I'm, I'm here. And I was like, are you sure? Because it looks like it's always closed to me. <laughs> always closed. And he's like, no, no, you know, sometimes I'm just stepping out to buy some stuff. And he shows me the stuff and I'm like, uh, is that for the restaurant? Because <laughs> mm, I'm pretty sure the restaurant doesn't have that on the menu, but maybe I'm wrong, you know? And I played it off and I was like, yeah, 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 whatever. And uh, I took him at, you know, face value. Even though I didn't believe him, I used the surface as a defensive tool. I was going to say weapon, but that's weird. I use the surface, you know, like if he's playing it off, then I'm playing it off. And because I don't want to step in a cobra's nest, you know, and I don't want him to think that I'm suspecting anything. And this is how shadow protects you because I made a judgment about his level of consciousness and his personality that I don't want him thinking that I'm in his business. I don't even want to be in his business. I was curious. I asked a question. I was surprised by his answer. And then I got more curious, which has always gotten me into trouble in the past. But it's part of the the shadow journey. And I have to say, when you master the shadow lessons, things like this are very illuminating and they're not frightening anymore because you wield a power of understanding people's intent and motivations far more than they realize is possible. So it actually gives you quite an advantage if you know how to use it and if you know how to apply the wisdom of your discernment. But I don't want to get too off track. This is the benefit of shadow work. People don't like to do shadow work, but this is like, it gives you superpowers in the end and it makes you a far better person highly recommend it anyway so the second time i bumped into him after seeing the restaurant was continuously closed and i noticed that it looked like they were moving out and so i stopped and i said hey are what's going on are you guys closing (laughs) 
And he said, surprised again, he said, no, we're, we're just moving to another part of town. I was like, oh, okay, well, how do you feel about that? And he rolled his eyes and he's like, uh, blah, blah, and kind of grumbled a bit. And the owner was there and I got another chance to read her. And I could feel that mm, my the initial read that I had that maybe she wasn't a very pleasant person was definitely true. It, I don't know. It was just a vibe that I got where I was like, I don't really want to be around either of you now. Anyway, so I wished them luck and I wished them on their merry way and I wasn't familiar with that part of the town. But I just so happened to run into the cook or he ran into me this weekend, just out of the blue, in totally different circumstances. And he came up and we started talking and I was like, oh, so how's it going with the restaurant that's, you know, been moved? And he grumbled again. And this was probably a week or two after they moved. And he grumbled and he was like, I'm not going back there. And I was like, oh, really? What's going on? He's like, I'm going on to my new life. I'm going on to my new chapter. He's been talking about this for a while, but there are things that are outside of his control that have been preventing him from making this really big move. And he is, uh, I wonder if I can say it. I think I can. Everything is anonymous. (laughs) But it's really interesting because he is planning on crossing into the United States illegally. And I think that that is really kind of cool that I know somebody that is on that journey. And the first couple times that he's tried to go with the coyotes, that's what they're called, the people movers, um, there were issues. I guess they had not secured the right guards or I don't fully understand the process but it's a business and this guy has been waiting for a long time and trying to pass and he had one failed attempt but he came back and so it's been like months in the making and he's going off to secure better finances but I don't know if he knows about the inflation and I don't know if he knows about how how hard it is right now so I'm I don't know anyway um it's been interesting to get to learn a little bit about how the world really works and to understand more deeply some of what you read about on the news but to see it from somebody else's perspective and when I was first talking to him about this adventure that he was going to go on. I was like, wow, that's really dangerous. And he was like, yeah. And he looked absolutely excited by the danger. And I was like, ah, you're one of those types of people. Maybe I should, (laughs) maybe, yeah, maybe we should be friends. And if I ever have any danger, you're my friend to call me because he just lit up with this excitement. He got this like, look in his eyes where he's like, I know there's danger. (laughs) And I was like, wow. Anyway, so I uh, was talking to him this past weekend and he was like, yeah, you know, we're going to go out again and we're going to do this and da 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 and everything's almost set. But he's been saying this for a while. And, um, but then he continued and he was like, yeah, and you know, the restaurant still owes me money. I was like, oh, really? How much money? And he told me, and I was like, oh, that's, you know, that's worth, you know, stopping and getting your money, your last check or whatever. But what I found interesting is that he continued, and <laughs> apparently, I, I don't know the details because, of course, he maintains that the restaurant was open and that he was not sabotaging it, right? And... I don't know why they're not paying him his last check and I don't know why he's not going back. I don't have any of those details. But what I do know is that after he confronted the boss about this sum of money, uh, he got blocked on WhatsApp. He got reported. So apparently he was quite threatening. 
And what I find really interesting about this example is that he was lit up with anger and he was contained, but he was, he, he was like vibrating with like, how dare they, how dare they, they're taking something from me and they're, you know, and it's, it's not a lot of money, but it is, you know, more than, you know, it's, it's meaningful. It's meaningful. Not significant, but meaningful. And what's fascinating to me is that looking at this from an outside perspective, I understand his emotional response. And I also understand why perhaps the owner is not paying him because he kind of tanked their business. (laughs) You know what I mean? He actually, he tanked it. And I know they moved and it doesn't seem like he got his shit together. It seemed like he continued to tank it. And based on the eye roll and the grumbling about the move, it was evident to me that he was not really invested as a business partner or as somebody that was really trying to help the business. Now, did he have cause for that? Probably, right? Because as I mentioned in the Becoming a Reality Shifter episode, it seemed as though maybe he was delivering karma And he was signing up for this karmic interaction with the owner. And they were playing out this vindictive story with each other, this revenge story. And they were slinging punches to each other, but in a very underhanded way. You know, on the surface being like, no, no, I'm I'm there at the restaurant. No, I guess you're just always walking by when I'm out. You know, I'm working by myself. And I'm like, hmm. Yeah, okay. (laughs) I am a reality shifter, but I'm not really buying it. So, but we're going to leave room for the possibility that you're not completely unconscious because this is not a reality layer that I want to exist in. So if there's a way out, then I'm going to manifest a way out because I understand that there are reasons that we are linked into reality layers where this type of behavior is acceptable. But now let's say that you're threatening to break somebody's legs if they don't pay you he didn't do that right but he did something to get himself actually blocked on whatsapp he showed me and i was like i've known some pretty sketch people and i've never known anybody that has gotten blocked from whatsapp he was talking about having to get a new phone with a new sim card and things of that nature and (laughs) So it's like this consequence comes because he was delivering a consequence who was delivering a consequence to him, who he was probably delivering a consequence to, right? So now we have this chain of events and we're down at the very last leg of unconscious entitlement, which is this, how dare they? Even though it might actually, how dare, I, how dare they? Even though somebody is responding to you, right? Not you, you, but you know, like talking to the person that has unconscious entitlement because I've had it when I've been unconscious and I know the feeling, it's a really big blind spot. It's like, well, I know that I did this, but they still shouldn't do this to me. You know, and it's this really peculiar thing that happens that I believe is the creation of a lot of nightmare realities. It's like everybody's a victim, even if you're the one that is throwing the first punch. It's really weird when you're unconscious, you are always the victim, even though you're the aggressor you know, and there are some situations where people are actually victims without being the aggressor. I'm not talking about those situations. I'm talking about the unconscious entitlement situations to where people have a massive blind spot and they get very riled up and very angry about this perceived injustice, which is actually a consequence a natural consequence, cause and effect of their behavior. 
And so it's like this really odd thing that happens where you will see the unspiraling of relationships or partnerships because people will interpret things in such a way that they, it maintains a victim narrative. And so, for example, there's this uh, one person that I actually, I really respect a lot. And they're on the enlightenment journey. And I won't get into their details because it's not my story to share. But giving you the broad strokes, they are going through a divorce right now. And they're going through a divorce because they cheated on their spouse. And they cheated on their spouse because their spouse was more loyal to their family than to the marriage. And so because this particular person saw this as an infidelity, even though this is an interpretation in their mind, this is why we do shadow work they launched an all-out war because they felt victimized that the person that they married didn't change for them. Think about that for a moment. The person that they married didn't change how close they were to their family. And as a result, this deeply pressed on the wounds of this the spouse and it pressed and it pressed and it pressed until they took revenge and they blew up the marriage and they blew it up in a pretty dramatic way and it was it was quite dramatic and then the spouse started launching a war against them you know they hit back and it was this huge event and in this both of their lives and this is one of those situations where when we are unconscious we feel entitled to launch wars with people because of feelings that we have based on interpretations to stimuli and events in our lives and as a result we get into epic failures and sometimes dangerous situations. So my own unconscious entitlement used to be that I felt entitled. Actually, I had a lot of unconscious entitlement that I had to work through. I felt entitled that I should know everything about the people in my life. And when they weren't, especially when I felt like they were hiding something, it caused me great discomfort. And as a result of my wounds and my shadow patterns, I felt that it was a betrayal. And so as a result, I would press people to tell me everything. And then I wouldn't be able to handle it. Or if they wouldn't tell me everything, then I would go investigating and find it out. And This also happened to be one of my super skills of reading people and seeing people's secrets. It was like, I didn't feel safe unless I knew your secrets. And I happened to be able to pry it out of people. And if I couldn't pry it out of people, then I would try to figure it out. Now I don't do that. But now it's like, I read people's shadow and so it's like I still know it, but it's a different experience where I don't force people to tell me things. And as a result, this ended up in some cataclysmic failures of relationships that I was responsible for undoing. I was responsible in a really big way, but whenever the relationship started unraveling, I didn't see my part and I didn't see my contribution. And so as a result, I felt victimized. Like for example, um, apparently I dated somebody that had a double life and I went snooping around and I got myself into a world of trouble 
because I went snooping around and instead of me owning my part, I just snooped around even more. And then I started trying to ferret out the truth. And then I started testing them. And then it became a war. Legit. (laughs) It really did. And as a result, uh, I started feeling very frightened and very threatened. And instead of taking ownership for my part of it, I felt very victimized. And so I share that with you to share that the ways that this can manifest, this unconscious entitlement, can actually be quite life-threatening in some cases. And it can actually be very, very detrimental to your well-being. But in, you know, the case of this cook and the case of the restaurant owner, somebody's safety was also jeopardized. So when you get to the end of the road of this unconscious entitlement, like it doesn't start off this way, right? But when you get to the end of the roads, it starts to look more and more like dead ends. And so you want to be very careful about your own paths of unconscious entitlement. Because when I work with people that are trying to be extracted out of nightmare realms, I also work with people that have blind spots and that everybody feels like a victim. And sometimes, and I'm not going to say all the time, but sometimes they're actually the ones that launch the first strike. And so we have to understand that. We have to unpack that. And we have to shift out of victim consciousness because when we're in victim consciousness, then it's a very disempowering place to be. And we end up sabotaging things in our life without seeing our part of it. And as a result, we repeat the same patterns and the same mistakes, but with different people and in different reality layers. And this is why you can't just shift out of a terrible experience. You can't shift away from consequences Like imagine the cook trying to reality shift away, you know, like after, you know, threatening to break somebody's legs, not saying he did that, but you know, like sometimes the universe is like, no, you're going to deal with your part of what's coming to you and you need to see your patterns. Like why is the restaurant not paying you? Why do they feel entitled not to pay you? Maybe because you didn't open the business for 60 days and they are experiencing severe financial shock. Maybe they don't even have the money. Hmm? You know, like, but how dare they? How, I, how, how, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go and make sure. And, you know, so we need to awaken to understand how we impact people and situations and why did the cook not open the restaurant maybe and I don't have this piece right maybe there was a really good reason and so we need to stop the wars before we get to the dead ends and to do that you need a certain level of maturity and sentience to be able to see your contribution And then to see somebody else's contribution and then to decide to do it differently. And so if you have reoccurring patterns in your life, particularly relationship breakups, those are some of my specialties. If you find yourself enmeshed in victim consciousness and you don't see how you are contributing to your part. And as a result, you continuously create victim scenarios for yourself. Please reach out to me. We can consider doing one-on-one reality coaching. We can get into your patterns, your unconscious entitlement. It's fun, you know, like it doesn't have to be shame filled. And so when we have a sense of humor about it, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a, a scavenger hunt in our psyche. 
and it's like dusting out the cobwebs. Oh, I found one. Oh, we found a pattern. It can be fun. It doesn't have to always be soul crushingly painful. And especially when you realize that all it takes is shining a light of awareness onto it. And once you see it, then that gives you the chance to stop yourself. And all you need is a couple of seconds. And once you have a couple of seconds, you can then bring your conscious control online and you can decide to choose differently. And where I help you is figuring out what the pattern is, figuring out what your knee jerk reaction is. You do the stopping yourself part. And then we decide and map out a different set of decisions that will lead to a different set of outcomes and thus a different reality for you. And it takes practice. It doesn't happen overnight, but it actually, it works. And it's really, it's a very straightforward method. You can even do it on your own. This is how I learned how to do it. I did a lot of self-therapy. And so get yourself a microphone and talk to yourself in voice notes or keep a journal. And all you need to do is you need to sift through your patterns of behavior, your psyche, your emotions, your triggers, figure out what your instinct is, and then do something different. It's kind of fun, actually. It's really fun to level up. You can email me at sacredjourneyproductions at gmail.com if you're interested in one-on-one coaching. And uh, we'll talk soon.